this is week three of our study, The Yokes of the Bible. In week one, we covered the yoke of bondage. And we discovered from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 that religion is a yoke of bondage. Religion without salvation is not freedom. It is freedom, the freedom of Christ. When we believe that Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, that He was buried and rose again, our sins are forgiven. He comes to live within us. We become the children of God that instant. And boy, that's being free. That's a wonderful thing. Amen? Amen. But those who don't have salvation, they have religion. Whether it's the Christian religion or some other religion, they're not free. They're carrying a burden. It's called a, a, the yoke of bondage. And that's what we talked about two weeks ago today. Then last week, we talked about the yokes of this world, and there are many out there. Anything that a person, any sin that a person cannot or will not give up is a yoke. And there's all kinds of yokes in this world. That was our subject last week. This morning, we're going to talk about another kind of yoke. It's called in Scripture the unequal yoke. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians and chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We have said that a yoke in Scripture is an oppressive uh, device and that uh, yokes we use to make animals, for example, oxen and other animals, uh, do uh, that which their owner wanted them to do. Pull a heavy load, pull a plow, or uh, whatever. And uh, these uh, yokes are in the Bible when uh, applied to men uh, are, are, are things that are, are, are not pleasant. They are oppressive. And now we find here in uh, 2 Corinthians and chapter number 6 and verse number 14, these words. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion at light with darkness. Here we have a, uh, a description of the unequal yoke. And we have a warning against being unequally uh, yoked. I want to illustrate what the unequal yoke is all about. I'm going to use my wallet. Here is, let this represent mankind. Each, each of us, let this represent our sin. In this condition, God loves us. We're sinners, but He loves us. We can't go to heaven. Our sin must be paid for. We must be righteous to go to heaven. And when we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died in our place to pay for our sin, our sins are forgiven and we're made righteous. So here's a righteous person. Here's an unrighteous person. He's still in his sin. Here's the difference. This person has accepted Christ. His sins are forgiven. Not only that, the Spirit of the living God lives within him. Because when you're saved, the Spirit of God comes to live within you. 1 John 5, 1, for example, says, He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That is the new birth that Jesus talked to Nicodemus about in John chapter 3. On the other hand, this person here, the unbeliever, He's still in his sins. He doesn't have the Spirit of God. He's in spiritual darkness. Oh, he knows there is a God. But, and he's got a conscience. But he's not saved. He's in spiritual darkness. So when a believer marries an unbeliever, you have an unequal yoke. And that, my friend, is against Scripture. And the Bible warns here not to be unequally yoked. Well, pastor, <clears throat> I know a man in another city, and he made the mistake of marrying a woman who isn't saved. Should he leave that woman because of that situation? She's caused him nothing but grief all since they've been married. Pastor, 
I know a woman in another state, and she made the mistake of marrying an unbeliever. Should she leave that husband that she married that's an unbeliever because of this verse? The answer to both of those questions is no. God is against divorce. There's probably many divorced people in this room today. And I am happy to say that when you accepted Christ as your Savior, whatever you did in the past, you've been forgiven. Amen? Amen. But God is against divorce. The only reasons He gives for a divorce in Scripture is immorality, unfaithfulness in the marriage relationship. So, uh, no, God does not want um, a woman, for example, to leave her husband because uh, he's, uh, he's an unbeliever. Uh, she's uh, got another job now uh, that uh, she, should, uh, she should do. And... Uh, her job is found in 1 Peter 3. She messed up by marrying an unbeliever. But now God says, and there's no promise that this is going to happen, but He says this is what you should work for. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. In the same manner, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they're not saved. They also may without the word be won by the behavior <laughs> of the wives. While they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of braiding the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but... Let it be the hidden man of the heart, that's Christ, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, ladies, there's what Christian womanhood should look like. And furthermore, God says <coughs> to the woman who's married to an unbeliever, this is how you should live. Maybe he will see your life and want what you have. Maybe he'll see Christ in you and he'll want what you have. If he won't listen to the word, then maybe he'll see the word being worked out in your life. And that's her role uh, now that she's married to um, an unbeliever. Let's fill in blanks number one and two. I'm going to make it easy for you. You won't have to worry about keep looking at back and forth. I'll let you know when it's time to fill in the blank. But let's fill in... Uh, a blanks number one and two. This verse does not teach that a saved person should divorce his or her unsaved mate. Okay, let's go to uh, the next one. This verse is a warning to those who are single and saved not to marry an unbeliever. Um, this verse is not instructing a believer who's married to an unbeliever. Believer. This verse from God is saying if you're single, don't marry an unbeliever. That's an important doctrine in the Word of God. All right. Um, next one. I'm unequally yoked. What should I do? You should try through godly living to win your mate to Christ. That says it all. There's no guarantee that that will happen, but that's what your goal should be. When Ann and I were a young couple, we lived in New York State. 
thank God he got us out of that cold, snowy morning. <laughs> we knew a young lady, grew up in the church. She dedicated her life. She said, I, I want to be a missionary or teacher. I'm not sure what, but she was going to serve the Lord. And she went off to Johnson City, New York, to the Bible College. They had a good Bible College. And she started studying for um, uh, a life of service. And she did well for a while. And she would come home and give a testimony in church about how good God was and how wonderful things were and so forth. But after a while, she slipped. You know, when we get away from personal Bible study and prayer, we slip. We need this word in our lives every day. It keeps us strong. It keeps us from the junk of the world. She somehow began to slip. And the next thing you know, um, she started <coughs> dating a guy. I think she was out of Bible college by this time. But she started dating this fella. Uh, some would say he's good looking. He was tall, lean. And she just kind of fell head over her heels and in love with him. The only problem was he was an unbeliever. She knew enough to know that she shouldn't marry him. But she did. And almost from day one, it was nothing but heartache and trouble and fights and arguments. And it just went on and on and on. And every time they'd get in one of those fights, she would look at him and she would say, I know why this is happening. You're an unbeliever and I should never have married you. Well, that just made him mad. You can't talk to someone who doesn't know the Lord like that. That's, that's not going to win it. How do you think it ended up? It ended up terrible. The marriage ended in divorce and her life just kept going down. down. She, she turned away from God for something that she thought would work. Even though the Word of God says in this verse, Be ye not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what? Fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. What communion hath light with darkness? Well, she started out well, but then it went downhill from there. In a church that I once pastored, just before a Sunday morning service, uh, a little lady come up to me. And she said, Pastor, I really need to talk. Is it possible that we could have a few minutes together after service today or sometime this week? And so after the service that day, we met down um, on the front row, the front pew of the church. And she told me her story. She had been raised in Tennessee, moved to Florida uh, sometime fairly young in life, I guess. And she was a well-dressed, attractive woman. Uh, she was a banker in town. She'd been coming to our church for a while, and she'd been growing in the Lord. But she was troubled, and, and she said, Pastor, I, I just, I've got to talk. Okay, let's talk. She said, Pastor, I've been married three times. And in addition to that, I've been in several different relationships with men. She said, every time... It ends up all wrong. I don't, I don't understand. She was totally frustrated and confused. And so I listened. And when she was finished, I said, uh, tell me about those men. Those men that you married and those men that you were in relationships with. Were they Christians? She was surprised. She looked at me and she said, Were they Christians? I said, Yes. She said, Well, no. But they were nice at first. I said, I want to show you a verse. I opened my Bible and I held it over so she could see it. 
And I read this verse to you. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with dark? She saw that verse, her mouth opened, her eyes got big, she read it again. Then she looked at me and she said, I never knew this. And then she said something interesting. She said, Pastor, why didn't the pastors that married me tell me about this before they married me? I said, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I think she got new insight into her problems that day. And I think she's been doing pretty well. That was over a quarter of a century ago. And Anne and I still hear from her. She wrote us a three or four page letter just a couple of weeks ago. Telling us how much we mean to her and, and, uh, and so forth. The unequal yoke. The light came on when she saw that verse. I have a story of another thing I need to tell you about. I was her pastor, so I can tell you this story in quite some detail. She shared a lot of things with me. She shared a lot of things with Anne. She was raised in the Northeast in New England somewhere. And they had moved to Florida. She had a nice husband. She had three little boys. Really little boys. And there was a tragic accident. Her husband was killed. So she's left alone now. She's got to raise three little boys. Well, she met a man. Wow. He was tall. Oh, good looking. Kind of swept her off her feet. And oh, he was so good to the boys. When he'd come to pick her up and take her on a date. He'd sit down and play with the boys a little bit. And, hey, how you doing, buddy? And, and so forth. And she thought, this is just wonderful. Oh, the problem is, he was an unbeliever. Now this lady knew, she was, a, she was young in the Lord. She was a baby. But she knew enough to know she shouldn't even consider marrying him. But, what she saw was something different. He was nice. She needed someone. And she needed some help with the children. It looked like the perfect solution. So they got married. She told Anne, and she told me, the very day we got married, he changed like that toward the children. Just like that. Now he was gruff to the children. Demanding from the children. Said harsh things to them. And all through their growing up years, they struggled. Struggled with self-image. Struggled with anger and all kinds of things. Well, they're grown up now. They're in their 40s. But guess what? Those fellas are still struggling. This dear lady would talk to my wife. And she'd tell her her problems in the marriage. And then she'd say to Anne, Anne, it's all my fault. I know it. I know it's my fault because I married an unbeliever. I know it's my fault. 
You see, folks, righteousness and unrighteousness, that's a bad yoke. Be not unequally yoked together. Today, she is still uh, a committed Christian. She's grown a lot in the Lord. But all that man has caused her pain and problems and heartbreak over and over again. Now, she loves her husband. But yet, it's not what it should be. It can't be. It's an unequal yoke. Yokes are oppressive. Wearing a yoke brings unhappiness, frustration, and misery. I want to go a step further this morning. A believer should not even date an unbeliever. And that needs to be taught to your children and your grandchildren needs to be taught in our youth group. It needs to be taught everywhere we have a chance to teach it. <laughs> I remember a couple out in Arizona. Byron and Breeze. They've been married for a lot of years. They were in their seven days. Is that about right in? In their seven days. And Bernice told us her story one day. She said, when I was a, a young lady, she said, I was saved and loved the Lord. And she said, I met Byron. Oh, she says he was the cutest little man. But she says, and he wanted to date me. But she said, I wouldn't date him. She says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you take me to church. She said, I wouldn't date him. I thought maybe if I could get him in church, he'd accept the Lord. I wouldn't even tell him why I wouldn't date him. She said, if I told him, then he might play some little mind game with me and make me think he got saved and he was just playing a game so I could date him. So she says, I didn't even tell him why. She said, after a few weeks, Byron saw his need of Christ and accepted Christ as his Savior. And she says, when that happened, she said, I said, oh boy, Byron got saved. Now I can date him. <laughs> Did I ever tell you what happened when I met Ann? Well, uh, we were teenagers. And uh, one Sunday, I went to church kind of half asleep. And uh, I saw Ann for the first time. Wow. <laughs> Gabriel flew down and fluttered in front of After about three seconds, he took an arrow out of his quiver, <laughs> took careful aim, <laughs> shot a love arrow right into my eye. <laughs> if that wasn't bad enough, another angel flew down with a big mallet, <laughs> hit me right over the head with something called a love mallet. Boom! I was down for the count. <laughs> I remember finally got to meet her about a week later I said to her at church my brother and his girlfriend are going down to Binghamton to play miniature golf on such and such a night would you like to go and she said, well, I'll ask my parents. So she asked her parents, and Ann and Don had their first date. Fast forward a few years, 
Ann and Don are going down the aisle together. They're now married. Where did it all start? The first date. That's why I say uh, an unbeliever uh, should never date an unbeliever. It's the first step toward marriage. You see it? It always starts with a date, doesn't it? It's the first step toward marriage. So uh, be wise in teaching your children and your grandchildren uh, not even to, to, to take that first step. Don't, don't, don't give the devil a chance to work in your life. And I, I'm so tired of people saying it's not just young people. It's uh, people that have been married for a while and they get mixed up with somebody else's mate and they say these words. Well, you know, we didn't mean for it to happen. It just happened. No, it didn't. Well, yeah, yeah, it did. It just, it just, just happened. No, it didn't. Here's what it takes. It takes time and it takes communication. Time plus communication equals a relationship. Don't spend time with that person that's not your mate. If you're married, that is. Don't spend all that time communicating with that person that, that's not your, your mate. But dating an unsafe person, if you're single, dating an unsafe person is not a, a wise thing. Well, um, let's fill in some blanks here. Two importing, important dating principles. A believer should not date an unbeliever. And here's another one. A believer should not date someone who simply claims to be a believer. Oh, they'll claim it. If they're not living the life I wouldn't even consider. Well, I, I thought that he was a believer. He said he was. And then we got married and, oh, brother, I found out. By the way, yeah, that, that happens so much. Spiritual growth is almost always hindered when a believer, let's say a lady, marries an unbeliever, a man, because their lifestyles are different. Their, their demands are, uh, uh, are, are different. <coughs> There's normally a lot of disagreements and grief and uh, shed tears. I want you to uh, take your Bible and find the, the little book of Amos. Go to the Old Testament and find the book of Daniel. Find Daniel, and we'll use that as a guide. When you get to Daniel, and then uh, you go forward to Hosea, a little book, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. I want you to see what the Word of God says. This was written about 2,700 years ago. Amos. See what the Word of God says here in Amos chapter 3 and verse number 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Look up here again. Believer, unbeliever. Can these two walk together except they be agreed? Probably not. Now, there may be some exceptions to the rule where they, they, they meet midway and, and, and so forth, but it's not a good situation. Um, it's the children in those homes. Uh, they tend to grow up and leave church. They tend to not be church goers once they've grown up. Even though that one mate is doing their best. There are exceptions. I'm telling you what I have found that the average is. Um, some do attend church when they grow up. 
and they've been raised in a home with an unequal yoke. But let me tell you about those kids who do grow up and attend church. Normally, not always, but normally, they tend to struggle spiritually with their walk with God all life long. God has a very specific reason for putting in his book, do not be unequally yoked. Well, let's uh, fill in some blanks here. We're going to fill in a bunch of blanks now. Common consequences of the unequal yoke. Spiritual growth is hindered. <clears throat> Discouragement and grief are the norm. Children that grow up in a home where there is an unequal yoke often grow up and leave the church. Here's what uh, all of us who love the Lord should do. This is the next page with this information. Fill in the blank. Pray for those who are involved in an unequal yoke. Pray for them. They're facing something that you don't know much about if, if you haven't been there, done that. Next, encourage the believer who is yoked to an unbeliever. One, offer hope for those who are involved in an unequal yoke. Number two, be sensitive to that believer who is yoked to an unbeliever. They don't need a lecture. They don't need to be told. They need to be loved and encouraged. Do I hear an amen? They need to be loved and encouraged, lifted up by the body of Christ. Be sensitive to their needs. When they're down, there's probably a reason for it. And that reason is probably something in the home. Uh, number three, pray regularly for the salvation of the lost person who is married to the believer. Here's something else you should do. You should teach what the Bible says about the unequal yoke to A, your children, B, your grandchildren. Some of you are grandparents. Many of you are. If you don't teach it, they may never hear about it until it's too late. C. Teach it to the Sunday school class if you're a leader in Sunday school. By the way, if you've got children in the home or even grandchildren, you should not only teach it to them once, you should teach it to them at least once a year. Teach it to them. Put it in a tickler file. If you have a tickler file, a tickler file is simply uh, a, a place where it's going to pop up at the same time every year, and you're going to see it. You're going to say, "Oh yeah, it's time for me to teach the kids again about the unequal yoke." Repetition is theological usage. Teach it to them again and again. Indeed, share these truths with other adults. The Word of God, the truth of God needs to be shared. Turn to 2 Timothy 2, please. 
And look what the Word of God says on this subject. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. And verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What Paul was saying here is the things that I've taught you teach to others that they can teach to others. And that's the way it works. The unequal you. Well, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, maybe for the first time. I, I got around the best I could, but some of you I didn't get around to. Um, there may be visitors here this morning. They say, well, I've never heard anything like this believer, unbeliever thing. I understand that. Um, we probably, we've all been there. Uh, but somewhere along the line, we understood that Christ made a complete payment for our sins. Paid it all. And we accepted Him as our Savior. And He saved us. Um, doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. It just means that we were privileged to hear the truth. That religion can't save us. That good works can't save us. That Jesus Christ loved us so much. He left heaven. Came to earth 2,000 years ago. Died in our place for our sins. Took all of our sin upon Himself. And that's effective for you the very moment that you will accept Him by faith as your Savior. That's the only way you can get to heaven. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter if you say, well, that's not my belief system. Oh, I respect you, your right to believe as you please. This is a free country and we love that. But I'll tell you, friend, there's only one way to heaven. And that's through Jesus. He's the sin bearer. He was the Messiah. He paid it all. He was God in the flesh. And He paid it all. And He did it for you. He paid for your sin. I don't know what your issues are. But I can tell you this. If you're not saved this morning, you've got some issues. Satan in this world will see to that. You've got some issues. And you need Christ. And you can have Christ. And He wants to save your soul. And he's just a prayer away. That's all. He's a prayer away. When you pray and say, Christ, I believe you died for my sins on the cross. I admit that I'm a sinner. I accept you by faith as Savior. When you pray that prayer or something simple, <coughs> sin. And you're sincere. You get this? He knows your heart. He knows if you're sincere. And if you're sincere when you pray that prayer, the moment you pray it, you're saved. And you're saved forever. He won't ever let you go. You'll be His child and He'll accept you into His family. And He will watch over you and provide for you and bring you through all the problems of life because He loves you that much. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, man or woman, boy or girl, I urge you to accept it right now, right where you sit. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you pray this prayer if you need to accept Christ? Just silently pray this prayer to Him. He'll hear your prayer and He'll save your soul. Dear Christ, I do believe that you're the Son of God. I do not understand it all. But I think this man up front was telling the truth this morning when he said, you paid it all. I'm accepting you as my Savior. Dear Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for me. Father, your word is clear. It's specific. Can't get around it. There's a yoke called the unequal yoke 
All the stories I've heard, Lord. The stories go on and on and on. How good we would do if we would always seek to know what your word says and to obey it. I pray for each one of these who raised a hand a moment ago. And by raising that hand, they were saying, I, I made a, a commitment this morning. I made a vow to God on one of these items. Whatever that item was, Father, bless them and help them in this important step of obedience. Now, Lord, there was one that raised a hand saying, I'm accepting Christ by faith as my Savior. Lord, I pray that that person will fully understand what you did for them and you paid it all. Bless them. Help them to, to read the Bible every day. To spend time praying to you every day. Give this person the direction that is needed to go through this life. May there be be a warm, clean feeling in that person's heart this morning. For that, we praise you. And God, as we stand and sing a brief invitation, have your own will and way at this invitation time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.